session. And um, I, I know many of you, but I'm, I'm Deidre Cruz. I'm Deputy Director of the Center for Health Equity and want to welcome you on behalf of um, both myself as well as our Center Director, Dr. Lisa Cooper, who um, actually today is her birthday and is away celebrating her birthday. Um, but certainly um, she sends you her greetings as well. Um, I hope you all were enjoying the musical interlude that we had um, in the few moments as you were sort of tuning in. Um, that first song, um, hopefully for many of you that were that were on and, and likely heard it, was uh, Come and Get Your Love by Redbone. And um, a couple of fun facts about Redbone. So it, it was one of the, one of the more famous um, indigenous bands. And the song, of course, is Love by Many. Um, the band was actually formed in 1969, and it was one of the first Native American rock bands in the sort of album era. And it's interesting because I think most people think that the song is about sort of a man singing to a woman, um, but it's, it's actually also about the coming together of different peoples. And so um, hope you enjoyed Come and Get Your Love. Um, our second song titled Missing Pieces that you just got to hear. Um, it actually was uh, perform written and performed by one of our panelists today. And I, I, maybe I'll, as, a, as an early guest, well, he's already smiling, so maybe he's giving it away, but <laughs> gonna give people a chance to, to, to guess which panelist that was, but um, I'm sure you'll hear more about uh, their bitty talents uh, as, as, we, as we move forward with our, our discussion today. So. Today's uh, jam session is, is, uh, is co-hosted by both the Center for Health Equity as well as the Urban Health Institute at, at Johns Hopkins and um, will be moderated by our very own Dr. Kelly Bauer. Um, and so Dr. Bauer is an associate professor at, at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. And she's also an associate director at the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute um, and in that role, um, she directs efforts to facilitate and recognize collaborations between communities, universities, healthcare delivery systems, and also the private sector in order to build collective capacity for achieving health equity in Baltimore. Many of you know, because you may have heard her speak, uh, Dr. Bauer's research um, and her public health nursing practice both focus on eliminating uh, racial and ethnic disparities in maternal and child as well as women's health. And um, she applies a, a community engaged approach both to her research as well as to her work as the uh, UHI Associate Director. And so I'm very happy to turn it over to Dr. Bauer who will tell us about our exciting panel today. Thanks so much, Dr. Cruz. Um, I am very excited to be here today. I want to extend a uh, Note of gratitude and thanks to the Center for Health Equity for um, inviting the Urban Health Institute here today for this presentation and to highlight what I think um, the audience will find to be really exciting work. Um, so I am really um, honored to share a little bit about the Urban Health Institute. I think, Natalie, are you going to share those slides? Great. So, you know, one of the things that we do um, at the Urban Health Institute as we um, introduce our events is an acknowledgement of indigenous and racial inequities. So um, I'd like to do that now. Uh, we acknowledge that the Johns Hopkins University and our schools are on the traditional and contemporary lands of indigenous peoples. Our campus is on unceded lands of the Piscataue and Susquehanna people. Today, there are more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, including members of the Piscataway, Lumbe, and Eastern Band Cherokee. We acknowledge the history of oppression and systemic inequities while representing all tribal nations' sovereignty. We strive to do our own work to address the inequities and disparities that Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Native American persons Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and other persons of color, members of religious minorities, LGBTQIA persons, persons with disabilities, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality experience while expanding partnerships with and following the lead of these communities. 
So I'm really excited today because I think that our speakers will really challenge us on how to do our own work and how to do work collectively to address the many inequities that we know exist in Baltimore and beyond. Um, so just to share with everyone a little bit about the Urban Health Institute before we get started. Um, the Urban Health Institute, if you are not familiar with us, was established in 2000. In the, in the year 2000, um, we really serve as an interface between all of the Johns Hopkins schools and the Baltimore community. And these are our sort of mission and goals to advance health and health equity in Baltimore by facilitating and recognizing collaborations between communities, universities, healthcare delivery system, government, and building collective capacity for achieving health equity mobilizing resources um, in support of promising strategies to achieve gains in the health and well-being of Baltimore residents and to advance an understanding, dialogue, and trust that will create pathways to health and well-being as well as social justice in Baltimore. And so two of the things that, you know, we do sort of have many offerings as part of the Urban Health Institute, but two of the things that we're really proud of our funding opportunities. Um, one is called the Baltimore Health Equity Impact Grants, and our speakers today have been recipients of this grant. A second grant is the Strategic Consultation Grants for Baltimore City, and both of them are really opportunities for our academic community to be in a meaningful partnership with community-based organizations in Baltimore City to work collaboratively to advance health equity. The Baltimore Health Equity Impact Grants um, are an annual uh, grant they come out, the RFA comes out in early fall. We just started a new cohort at the beginning of the year. So um, we'll be putting out another RFA at the end towards the fall of this year. And the strategic consultation grants are really an opportunity for our academic community, faculty, and students to be in partnership with government organizations in Baltimore City to also advance health, well-being, and equity in Baltimore City. And those applications are accepted on a rolling basis. So if you have any questions, we would really encourage you to go to our website, um, to send me an email, any of our staff, Natalie Wiggins is on this call, um, uh, to find out more we'd love to share. Um, and again, because our speakers today have been the recipients of our Baltimore Health Equity Impact Grants, we wanted to share a little bit about the reach of our two grant opportunities. Um, so this infographic just helps to kind of describe um, the grants that we've given out since 2008 when these grant opportunities were established. Um, we have uh, provided grants to 128 community partners, 36 city or government partners, um, a variety, nearly all of our Johns Hopkins schools have been represented in the faculty or student um, recipients of these awards. Um, we've had 99 students and 87 faculty receive the awards. And we've had a total of 173 health equity impact grants, six COVID grants and 13 strategic consultation grants for a total of $1.56 million that we have um, distributed between 2008 and 2023. And so, we're really um, you know, excited about the work to advance equity in Baltimore. And, and again, we'll be highlighting two of our awardees today. Cool. So without further ado, I'm really excited and honored to present and introduce our four speakers that represent, like I said, two of our Urban Health Institute Baltimore Health Equity Impact grantees, um, Tara Madri and Carrie Hawk Lassard received an Urban Health Institute uh, Baltimore Health Equity Impact Grant in 2020. The title of their grant was Exploring Urban Native American Food Security and Food Sovereignty in Baltimore Using Mixed Methods Research. And so I'd first like to introduce Tara Madri. Tara is an enrolled member of the Salt Cité Marie tribe of the Chip Chippewa Indians and a member of Baltimore, Detroit, and Minneapolis urban native communities. Madri received her MSPH in human nutrition from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and is now a second year PhD student in the social and behavioral interventions program. Tara's work centers on promoting cultural food values to promote holistic well being and balanced nutrition. Tara is passionate about food justice, food sovereignty, indigenous research methodologies, and urban native health. 
And Tara, I'm gonna ask you to pronounce the name of your tribe. So I'm sure that we get that correct. I apologize. No, no, you're totally okay. Um, I'm from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Thank you. Thank you. And three fun facts about Tara <laughs> are that she never learned to ride a bike, that Steve Irwin is her personal hero, and that if she ever gets out of grad school, her dream is to grow corn. And so I would love, in particular, that last fun fact, Tara, um, have you ever grown corn before? Yes, I have. I used to work with a food sovereignty movement in Detroit. Oh, wow. That's really exciting. And is corn um, the only crop that you're interested in? No, I like all crops, but I think corn is especially rewarding. I think it's a really fun one. And everybody likes corn, so. Everybody does like corn. And it looks like you're getting some um, others in the chat who are saying that you um, are in good company and not knowing how to ride a bike. <laughs> Um, very good. Our second um, presenter is Carrie Hawk Lassard. Carrie Hawk Lassard is an applied medical anthropologist currently serving as executive director of, of Native American Lifelines, an urban Indian health program funded by the Indian Health Service. Her work focuses on creating culturally grounded health promotion disease prevention programs informed by an understanding of the historical and intergenerational trauma experienced by the Baltimore American Indian community, of which she is a lifelong member. Carrie is a descendant of Irish, Fort Peck, Assinboine, and Shawnee people. And Carrie, I'll also ask you to be sure that I or pronounced your tribes correctly. Yes, Fort Peck, Assiniboine. Assiniboine. Thank you. So fun facts about Carrie. These are all really good fun facts too. Um, Carrie loves squirrels, like a lot, she says. Um, Carrie speaks seven languages. She says that she doesn't speak all of them well, but I bet that she's being modest. And um, this one is two fun facts in one, Carrie. Um, it says Carrie's stepson may be the bass player of the Dave Matthews band, but she knew Dave Grohl before he did. So that those are two fun facts. How did you meet Dave Grohl? Uh, we both hung, I'm old, and we both hung out at the 930 Club uh, together. And it was just by happenstance that I married a musician whose son is also a musician. Oh my goodness, that is a great story. Um, sorry, I hope you guys are, I hope our um, uh, uh, presenters are watching the chat. There's fun um, comments in there for you. Um, our next two presenters um, are Daniel Stolswus and Dennis Antoine. They were a recipient of a Urban Health Institute COVID-19 grant titled Telehealth Delivery of Behavioral Health Services for Homeless Persons at Helping Up Mission. So Daniel Solstice, um, after 25 years of leadership and faith in community-based organizations, Daniel considers it a privilege to serve as Chief Executive Officer at Helping Up Mission. He joined Helping Up Mission in 2018 after a national search and worked closely with Helping Up Mission's outgoing CEO. Daniel's motivation is rooted in his belief in the focus of, on life transformation and recovery and the strong collaboration with embedded community partners embodied at Helping Up Mission. He served in, a, in an array of operations, development, and executive leadership roles in Virginia, New York, and Arizona after joining the Helping Up Mission. Daniel has earned a master's in public health administration from New York University's Wagner Graduate School of Public Health and holds a bachelor's degree in history from Indiana Wesleyan University. <clears throat> and some fun facts about Daniel, one of which I can already, um, I can already you get a little preview to in his bio. The first one is that he's lived in 11 different states. So I can already count several of them from that bio there. <laughs> um, He's driven a moving truck between the East Coast and the Southwest seven times to work with seven different nonprofits. That is a long drive. And he has a life goal to drive through all U.S. states and national parks. He's been to 47 states and 23 national parks. 
So I'm going to take this opportunity, Danielle, to um, take a selfish moment and say, <clears throat> I'm wanting to take a trip to the national parks, which is the best, or maybe what are the top two, three that I can't miss? I got to go with Glacier National Park, oh. uh, the most recent one, but my, my kids lived through maybe the fun, but perhaps the trauma of visiting 10 national parks in 15 days on a family road trip in a minivan. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Oh, see, that's what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Give it a little more time. That's all I would say. But all right. Glacier, I think, is a is a is a great one, but they're all beautiful. Well, we'll connect after this. It sounds like other people have this on their bucket list as well. So um <clears throat> Uh, next is Dennis Antoine. Dr. Dennis Antoine is an assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Antoine's clinical expertise is adult psychiatry. He earned his medical degree at the Howard University College of Medicine. He completed a psychiatry residency and behavioral pharmacology fellowship at Johns Hopkins. And you already learned one fun fact about Dr. Antoine at the beginning of this and his musical expertise is not even, well, it is one of the fun facts that you taught yourself how to play guitar uh, is one fun fact. A second is cycling is my favorite outdoor hobby. And the third is that he used to teach calculus. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, how did you teach yourself to play guitar? And was that high school or college calculus? And do you still do tutoring? I bet there are people on the call who have kids who can use tutoring. No, long, no longer tutoring. Um, for, fortunately, that was a that was a medical school gig, uh, tutoring on the side. But uh, the, the guitar piece was during medical school between step one and uh, I think my third year, second year. I, I just had a lot of free time. And yeah, uh, because of that, that, I now play. <laughs> I now play upside down and backwards. So anyone who knows how to play the guitar, just don't don't look at me. <laughs> wow, um, you put the rest of us to shame, or me, um, at least. All right. Well, it's really fun to sort of see the multi multi dimensionality of our speakers, and um, I'm really grateful to each of you for being here with us today. I think we will start, if it's okay, with. Um, with Carrie and Tara's presentation, and then we'll move on to Danielle and um, and Dennis's presentation. So what we'll do is um, each of these amazing um, uh, presenters will talk about the UHI grant that they received and the work that they did um, for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have some conversation. I'll ask some questions to learn more, and then there'll be an opportunity for our audience to chime in with their own questions. So... everybody see that okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm excited to present today with Carrie, and I am getting over a cold, so I apologize if I sound a tiny bit sick today. So before we really get started, I know we did intros, but who we are is a really important part of how we come to research as accountable relatives. So I wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit more about me, which maybe you're sick of hearing about me, but that's okay. Um, so as um, I was introduced, I am a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, which is a tribe located on the border of Canada and the upper peninsula of Michigan. Um, I grew up in Metro Detroit though. Um, so like most native people, I grew up as an urban Indian, more than 70% um, of American Indian and Alaska native people grow up in urban areas or live in urban areas. Um, I'm a language learner, so I'm still a learning Ojibwe. Um, and I'll actually take a moment to introduce myself in Ojibwe. So, Buju, Mishkwan, Ngakwe, Nijishnikaz, Munati, Ngajojava, Mishiki, and Dudem. Greetings, my relatives. Um, that's just a way that we ground ourselves and kind of position ourselves as relatives in how we introduce ourselves. Um, hopefully, you can see this, um, the pictures here, but you'll see that I'm really passionate about a lot of things, mostly food and my dog. So, you'll see lots of pictures of food, my dog, and of course, my family members. Um, and as was mentioned, I do have a degree in nutrition, but that's really a fancy way of saying I really love to talk about food. So I'm excited to be here with you all today to talk a little bit about food and some of our work with Carrie and Native Lifelines in Baltimore. I'm going to pass it to Carrie. Wopina Tara Ham, Midakyapi, Carrie Hawkless, Ardemachiapi, 
and uh, Executive Director of Native American Lifelines, Himie. My name is Carrie hawk Lassard, and um, I am the Executive Director of Native American Lifelines. Um, I am the descendant of Clark Gregg, who was a student at the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. Um, my Tugashi, or grandfather, was originally from the Fort Peck Reservation in Montana. And so, uh, like Tara, language learning is really important to me, especially understanding that our ancestors weren't allowed to speak their languages. Um, he moved to Baltimore after graduating from Carlisle in the late 1800s. And our family has been urban Indians ever since. Um, it's important to me in our work to make sure that I'm talking to my community and understanding their conceptualizations of wellness. And for Native people living in Baltimore, um, they mentioned feeling invisible as a reason why they weren't able to achieve and sustain wellness and feeling disconnected from their culture. So the photographs I chose are one near the Creative Alliance. If you're from Baltimore, this is called the Duality of Indigeneity. Um, and it's a mural painted by my very best friend, Greg Deal, who's a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. And uh, the other photograph uh, is at Lifelines, and it is myself with an aspiring upright bass player who is a member of the Navajo Nation. So uh, happy to be here speaking with Tara, whom we love immensely. Thanks, Gary. Cool. Well, we're going to get to it because we have a short time with you all today to present on this. Um, so we call this study the Baltimore Native Food Study. And in fancy words, it's a sequential, explanatory, mixed methods, community-based participatory research study, which is a really fancy way of saying we started with doing a survey and then we talked to people. So this, um, this award was given to us in January 2020, which, as we all know, in March 2020, the world kind of turned upside down and sideways for many of us. Um, so as we started this project, the plans shifted a lot from what we originally proposed to meet community needs. Um, so the quantitative survey originally was really only supposed to include the food security module and demographics. Um, but we expanded that to include some other measures like food stress, which is a little bit more of a holistic measure of looking at food security, looking at how does access to food affect how our mental health and our stress levels. And then, of course, we looked at COVID-19 hardships. How did COVID-19 affect our community? And then from there, um, we purposely selected people for interviews based on their food security status to really deeply understand what is it like to be food insecure as a Native person in Baltimore. Um, and we learned a lot from that, and so I'll share about that in just a minute. Um, Carrie, do you have anything to add here? Um, I wouldn't add anything else, but Tara is absolutely right. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, like with everyone else, really upended our intentions. So based on the first phase, which was that quantitative survey, we did a bunch of like fancy analyses and there's a bunch of numbers here and these are odds ratios and things like that. So if you're into data, great, look at this. If you're not, just listen to me. Um, so basically what we found is we found a pretty high prevalence of food insecurity in this community. So you'll see that for very low um, food security, we have 10.8% of the community or those surveyed, we had a sample of 250 adults. Um, and for low, we had 17.2% which when you think about it, like those numbers are just numbers, but when you pause and really think about it, that's 28%, that's more than a quarter of our community that's really struggling to have access to food. And these numbers are real people and these, this is a very heartbreaking thing. So I just wanna emphasize the humanity behind some of these statistics. So looking at these odds ratios, there's a bunch of numbers here and some things popped up as significant. I think these are things we would know from talking to people, right? Experiencing COVID-19 hardships, like being laid off or catching COVID-19 and not being able to take off of work really increase people's odds of experiencing food insecurity. Also food stress, things like not having good access to food or not having time or availability to cook foods also was associated with increased odds of food stress or food insecurity. But some of the positive things, I always like to highlight positive things. I think of myself as a strengths-based researcher. One of the really positive things that popped out in model four is that people who engaged in subsistence practices, so things like gardening, hunting, or fishing, they reported those as a source of food for them, they had significantly reduced odds of experiencing food insecurity. So it's a really positive finding that when our community members are able to engage in our traditional ways of being, they have reduced odds of experiencing food insecurity. So I wanna highlight that positive finding. So when we talked to people, um, there were a lot of things people said, but one of the main things people really pushed back on in qualitative interviews is that we'd start the interview as you do with most qualitative interviews to say, hey, we're here today to talk to you about food insecurity or food security. 
And people would be like, you know, I don't actually know what that means. And so we'd read them the USDA, how the United States Department of Agriculture defines food security. And people often were like, you know, that definition, I'm not a fan. And so it was really interesting that that brief check for understanding became a really important way that people were able to push back on dominant society definitions of food security. So people talked about just briefly, I'm going to highlight a few things. They said that food security isn't always connected to culturally relevant foods. They also talked about who gets to define what's socially acceptable. If you're feeding your kid McDonald's because that's the only thing you can afford, why should you be shamed for that? Another person talked about things like foraging. It wouldn't be socially acceptable in Maryland to stop on the side of the road and pick food or um, I grew up in Michigan. If you hit a deer, we just put it in the back of the truck and processed it and ate it. But it's really not a socially acceptable way to be food secure in Baltimore City. So people highlighted things like that. And then people also talked about the cultural aspect. They talked about creation stories. So in the definition of food security, it talks about food that's safe for human consumption. But for us, it's not just about having food that's safe for us as humans, but food that's safe for our more than human relatives and is safe because it's part of our relatives and our creation stories. I just want to highlight that. Okay. And then also people really talked about food insecurity. People think about food security as a very transient state. People are food insecure for a period of time and then they're not. But it was interesting when talking with people in qualitative interviews, even if they weren't defined as food insecure at the time that they took the first survey, a lot of them described being food insecure at various points in their lives. And so people talked a lot about the long-term impacts of experiencing food insecurity. So people talked about things like having almost eating disorders because they felt like they needed to pay penance for eating unhealthy foods when they were food insecure as a child. Another person really talked about satiety cues and how like growing up food insecure, they were really incredibly encouraged to finish all the food on their plate and how that really affected their relationship with food in the long term. Okay. Um, so one thing, Carrie, and I think Carrie can speak to this a little bit more, that Native Lifelines was interested in through learning through this study and this partnership was what does food sovereignty look like for the Baltimore Native community? And for those that don't know, food sovereignty is this idea that the community has the right and the agency to determine their own food ways and their own food system. And so when we started talking to people, people talked a lot, a lot about partnership with other community organizations. They talked about um, backyard Base Camp and the Black um, Church Food Security Network as being really important to providing food security for the Baltimore Native community. And at first, when people, if anybody's heard of food security or food sovereignty, a lot of times it's um, purported to mean self-sufficiency in food system. And at first, when I was reading all these things, it was kind of like the academic in me was like, oh my gosh, maybe these people don't understand what food sovereignty means. But then, you know, when I talked to Carrie and talked to my aunties back home, it became so clear that that's not what this is about. When you look at this through the lens of our cultural teachings and who we are as Native people, it's about kinship and being in relationship. And so for the Baltimore community, their vision for food sovereignty isn't being totally self-reliant right now. It's about having kinship with other communities in Baltimore City and being able to decide what their community wants to do with the support of other communities that are near them. Mary, did you want to add anything to that? Sure, I would just add that um, at earlier points in our history, you know, a lot of the members of the local Baltimore community come from the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, and they are a group of people historically who had farms or worked on farms and now after generations of being urban Indians really are disenfranchised uh, from some of those cultural traditions. So it's always been important to people in our community to reestablish their relationship with food, but part of that for them has also been reestablishing their relationship uh, with, with other people. And in Baltimore, particularly in a time of stress such as COVID that really amplified people's feelings of stress related to po poverty and and sort of, you know, a, a lack mentality, um, being able to partner was very important to them. And so I, I think just the, the feelings of vulnerability and the knowledge that there were other people on whom they could rely was deeply important to people in our community and has formed longer lasting relationships with other black and brown and under-resourced communities that, that only strengthen us, which is a, a, a kind of an unforeseen uh, response to this, I, I think. Thank you, Gary. So when we talk to people about what they really wanted, what the community kind of needed to move forward or what we needed in our food movement, 
they gave kind of three main answers and we present these using a three sisters analogy, which the three sisters are um, a growing technique that has been used by indigenous people since time immemorial. And it includes corn, beans, and squash, and they're complementary proteins, which as a nutritionist is interesting. So together they do make a complete protein, but they also grow in this symbiotic way that helps each other flourish. And so I'm just gonna go through these and kind of explain why each of these um, fits one of the three sisters. So people first really talked about food security and food access. Our people need to have food so that our children grow up with good development and that our adults can function and be well people. And so that's what we think of as corn. Corn is our oldest sister. You plant it first and it grows up out of the ground first and it provides structure and strength for the rest of the system. Secondly, people really talked about during COVID-19, to pardon the pun, they were really hungry for community events and education. They really wanted to gather together and be able to share meals. And people specifically talked about youth education and empowerment. Are our youth gonna be able to know how to grow their foods and know their foods? And so for them, or for this one, I use the word or use the analogy of beans. I also think I have bean brain, which have you ever seen how beans grow? They grow like everywhere like crazy, but it's all connected. And <laughs> so that's how my brain works. Um, but beans grow up the corn. So they normally grow up the corn, but they also provide nitrogen to the soil, which helps all of the plants to flourish. And then lastly, people talked a lot about partnership and kinship with other community-based organizations. They talked about partnering with existing urban farms and food sovereignty movements to grow our cultural foods in partnership with existing organizations. And squash, I think you've all seen squash. Squash have these beautiful broad leaves and this lovely spiky little spine. And the spiky spine helps to keep pests out, so it helps to protect the system. And the broad leaves help to keep the moisture in the soil, which helps all of them flourish. So together, all of these three findings, we present using this analogy because the first time I presented it at a community event, people's eyes were glazed over and they were like, that's really cool, man, but like, whatever. And when I started talking about it using this analogy, people, it really spoke to them because this is part of our culture and part of how we think about food. So some community action from this study, I, Native Life Alliance is always doing so many amazing things, um, but some things that we've been really proud of is we partnered with Hungry Harvest last summer to do a summer solstice research conversation. And through that, we um, were able to distribute produce to community members and talk more about what does our community need in the food, um, in our food ways, and what do we want to do to move forward. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, we had a spring equinox community conversation, and we were able to implement some of the ideas from the summer solstice conversation about making a community cookbook, and people were able to bring their own recipes and write why the recipe was important to them on the back, and we're working on that. Um, and then I'm also working on a measurement development project to redefine food security through Native voices and values. I'm also continuing my um, dissertation research with Native Lifelines and working on forming research councils. Sarah, do you want to add anything before we pass um, it over? I would like to say that I, I think this project and our work with Backyard Base Camp um, really was a springboard, not just to growing food, but growing community. One of the outcomes of that, you know, food, as Tara mentioned, you know, has stories and, and has its own life and its own identity. And um, Backyard Base Camp is offering the Native people in our community the space to grow the traditional foods that they want, to grow a medicine garden that they want, but also to have access to land where people can uh, have ceremony, sweat lodge, for example, because that's very difficult to find in dense urban environments like this. So I would argue that not only were we growing good seeds in the terms of the, the food that we provided, but we were growing good seeds in terms of the community connections that we were making. So we're really pleased with that. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Cool, and I think I'm gonna stop there. We'll pass it to Kelly. Oh, just um, thank you so much, Tara and Carrie. And we're um, just a wonderful presentation. I know our audience is gonna have a lot of questions. I think we'll, um, if people have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will um, circle back to them. We're gonna go ahead and move to um, Daniel and Dennis. Um, and their presentation, and then we'll have some panel conversation. Thank you. So great to be with everybody, and I'm just really thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about our collaboration and helping our mission with Johns Hopkins Cornerstone Clinic and the and the 
work that we were able to do through the pandemic in particular with, with telehealth, um, working with Dr. Antoine. So I'm just going to give a couple slides here, just a quick overview of helping on mission. I'm going to turn it over to Dennis, and we're going to go back and forth on pieces of this. But if you're not familiar with helping on mission, we have a 500 bed campus for, for men, and we recently opened about a year ago a 200 bed facility for women, and we have up to 50 beds for their children. Um, they're both located on East Baltimore Street. Our focus, um, we do have some, some beds for overnight guests, but our focus is on longer term residential recovery for alcohol and substance use disorder. Um, here's a little bit about our, our mission. That's from the lobby of our men's campus, um, but you know, our, our model really is built on partnership, not only, you know, what we do at Helping a Mission with our, with our programs, but because we're taking a, a much more holistic approach, uh, the partners that we have, including uh, Dr. Antoine and his team from Cornerstone to meet, um, meet physical, psychological, social, and spiritual needs. Um, one, one unique fact that I would point out about our program is that uh, Sixty-five percent of our staff are graduates of our program. I think that's a really unique aspect to our culture, um, organizationally, and has helped to create some some diversity and really a depth of strength um, in our program. Um, to have so many people that are invested in their recovery and have been graduates of our one-year program. I mentioned the new center opening up. Here's a kind of an illustration. This is our men's campus and sort of how that's uh, built out over time, pulling together a number of buildings there uh, on the the, um, the thousand block of uh, East Baltimore. And then on the 1200 block, you may have driven past this building, but we have our new center for, for women and children, which opened in March. Um, our flagship program is really our uh, spiritual recovery program. Um, we have spiritual life classes. It's very much sort of 12 step uh, focused. We're big on life enrichment activities, a lot of outdoor activities, um, ranging from everything from hikes on the Appalachian Trail to equine therapy to um, right now, a lot of our um, clients in our program are down at Camp Obana on the Chesapeake Bay, um, spending some time uh, in the in the outdoors there. So uh, we also have an opportunity for our residents to stay for two to three years after they graduate. Here's a couple of kind of quick um, aspects to our program, the access to healthcare services. Um, we do a lot of the appointment management. That's what makes the partnership that Dennis is going to talk about work. And then we have uh, Innovative Learning Center Workforce Development. And we're a very peer-driven model, so peer recovery specialists who staff our program who are all uh, also program graduates. So I will, uh, I think the next one is you, Dennis. Sounds good. And, and uh, this partnership in some ways has been uh, building since 2006 uh, between Hopkins and Helping Up Mission. Um, what happened is that there were uh, leaders on both sides uh, of the table who reached out um, uh, and especially uh, some coming towards the substance use disorder area in Hopkins looking for evidence-based programming that to be provided within the building or for the residents of Helping on Mission. In, in, in particular, for the process that I was part of back in 2010, we wanted to bring something on site uh, because prior to that, there had been uh, and there continue to be uh, connections to Helping on Mission that include the Broadway uh, clinic uh, that looks at medication for assisted treatment or medication for opioid use disorders. And there had also been other uh, pieces where uh, people would live at Helping Up Mission, but go up to the Hopkins campuses uh, to get their treatment. But the desire was to say, what can we do to decrease those barriers of going back and forth? Um, so what happened is it, with all that planning, we, we opened up a clinic in 2012 that actually resides on the fourth floor of one of the buildings in Helping Up Mission. So we brought a clinic that was on the Bayview campus and we moved it into and got it accredited in the fourth floor of the building. So that literally about 50 to 100 feet away, uh, that's all the, the person would have to do in terms of walking to their appointments. And the capacity has gone up and down. Our, our initial thought process was to have a capacity of 100 individuals that we can enroll into the clinic. Uh, and that's still kind of the goal to get there for substance use disorder counseling. But we've since added on 
uh, mental health treatment, which makes the capacity really a, a moving figure uh, because we try to adapt in different ways for how we can treat individuals, uh, whether it's substance use disorder, counseling, or mental health treatment, or a combination of both, we try to individualize what treatment they receive. And we've stuck pretty closely with the hours of Monday through Friday in terms of a uh, standard outpatient clinic. And we have the goal of serving the individuals that are uh, living in the mission. That's part of our accreditation as well at this time, um, because that allows us to make sure that there's a, an assessment of readiness. And we found that there's such a high demand within the building that uh, opening the, 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 you know, the doors up to the entire community would probably not allow us to serve the individuals in the mission properly. So we've kept it uh, in this type of a catchment area for, at this time because uh, there's a lot of work to be done within the building. And a lot of our programming in the clinic is based off of uh, evidence-based programming. We've uh, offered group and individual sessions, for both the substance use disorder and mental health sessions. And it's based off of something called reinforcement-based treatment, uh, which is evidence-based and starts with some of the behavioral analysis techniques of, of what we would call the ABCs of behavior, the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences of substance use and other behaviors as well that can be problematic. Uh, and we start there and then uh, make sure that we go deeper into a person's uh, life course to see what things can we help out with with other resources. And as we work with individuals on that, there's what we found also been a need to work as a partner with helping a mission between Hopkins and helping a mission to see what conflicts do we need to look at in terms of our workflow throughout the day. Uh, so there certainly have been opportunities there where uh, we've had to sit down and say, yeah, we're doing programming for this individual and uh, it circles around things like cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing, things that we know. But over the course of a week, as events pile up and accreditation visits pile up, we've had to also talk about what conflicts happen in real time. So uh, we you know, see who's missing appointments and uh, figure out how we get people attending on a regular basis to, to get treatment that's really helpful for them. And that's really required regular updates on an ongoing basis, which happens even to this day. We do daily emails and weekly meetings and also monthly meetings to make sure we're all on the same page. Some of that is day-to-day -day operations for the sake of the individuals getting treatment, but uh, a lot of that also has to do with strategic planning uh, and also bigger scheduling uh, coordination between the two institutions. And that's where our monthly meetings with senior directors happens. And we've really called it different names over the years. And we landed more recently on calling it the Clinical Management Committee because there's so much going on between the two institutions that um, we, we felt that that type of management needs to be a regular conversation with leadership. Otherwise things may go awry and uh, we won't be able to plan properly for each other in our uh, mutual institutions. And I, I think there's a lot of different ways you can look at the success of what we've been doing. And this is some of it is prior to COVID um, in that we really had uh, you know, a good setup at the beginning. People were 50 feet away up to 100 feet away and they were down the hall, we were in the same building, but we still found that when we were trying to get a minimum of nine hours for each person getting treatment, only 30% of the individuals reached that nine hour mark each, each week. And that was a problem at the beginning in that we would hope with the close proximity of treatment that people would come in and um, we had to do a lot of those conversations to say, hey, how can we get them up to a higher uh, attendance rate? such that 78% of individuals or 80% of individuals uh, came into the door at least nine hours a week. And that was important and we achieved that. Now, uh, up to this point, I haven't really talked about the COVID pandemic and you can see there wasn't much of a blip on when it came to FY21, which we call 2021 to 20, uh, 2020 to 2021 and then 2021 to 2022. There wasn't that much of a blip. And I think the uh, grant that we received was a big part of that. Um, and that's what I'll be getting into momentarily. But overall, we have found that us being in the building has extended treatment for individuals who present to helping a mission by approximately 55 days. And that's been something that's very impactful and very, uh, very, very important for us to keep an eye on. But when it came to the pandemic, that's where the Urban Health Institute was uh, uh, critical. And I can't use a, a stronger word to say that because uh, without that grant, I think this would have all fallen apart. Um, we got to a point of engagement and then COVID happened and we really uh, used the Urban Health Institute to convert to telehealth 100% um, in a matter of about three weeks. And it took a lot of work on the part of helping a mission to make sure that we could get the equipment in, a lot of the Urban Health uh, Institute staff to make sure we uh, had the right uh, requirements met for the grant itself. 
and also the Cornerstone staff to make sure we got tablets and other telehealth equipment in, uh, into the building and shipped during a time where, uh, as we all know, logistics were very difficult. Uh, but we made that turn in, uh, on a dime almost, and it allowed us to go to telehealth completely for a, a long period of time to the point where still about 85% of our operations are telehealth right now. Um, we yeah. also took that a little bit. Oh, go ahead. I can just jump in with one anecdote on that, you know, that I think speaks to the partnership, the the tablets during quarantine. I mean, I remember one time when we had, I, I think it was close to 20, 15, 20 residents from our program were in the Lord Baltimore Hotel, which was the citywide quarantine site. And Dennis and his team working with our team were able to get tablets to, to those clients while they were in quarantine isolation so that the behavioral health services were not disrupted. I think that's a kind of an anecdotal example to give a little sort of uh, detail on what that partnership looked like and the importance of the grant. Yeah, yeah, I, and I would reiterate, I don't, we would not be able to pull this off or been able to pull this off without the grant. It, was, it truly was critical and a, and a lifesaver for the operation. So I'll probably say that a few more times over the course of uh, this talk. Um, but yeah, tablets, TV screens, equipment, um, that that moved with you as you moved across the room as well. It's pretty good stuff that we we pulled off, and we were able to dovetail some of that into a, an award from the FCC to explore how this connectivity could really set the stage for other endeavors. So it, there was a lot going on, and um, it was the the beginning of a, a pandemic partnership in different ways. Um, as I mentioned, the telehealth equipment we moved into the classrooms, the tablets, as Dan mentioned, um, we had them ready for people to use in the Lord Baltimore Hotel. So we didn't really have that big of a dip in terms of our attendance, but we took it a bit further to make sure we partnered with their primary care providers who were inside of GBMC. And we had regular Microsoft Teams meetings so we could coordinate. And we even at one point, uh, in, in Helping Our Mission did a lot of work with this as well uh, to get this moving forward. There was COVID testing access for um, all the intakes during the pandemic um, at Hopkins. Um, and that's something that took a whole Whole bunch of coordination between the health department helping a mission and Hopkins to make sure there was safety in the building where approximately 300 to 400 people could live. We wanted to make sure it was safe as possible and then do education about vaccinations, all of which was really facilitated through this telehealth equipment. I don't know, Dan, if you had any thoughts on, on this slide. There was a, a lot we accomplished there. Well, I think just, just to highlight that, you know, there was so much of a narrative and particularly early in the pandemic about congregate facilities, residential facilities not being safe. Our data actually, through the process of doing those intake testing, kind of proved a different story, but it was really important to have those resources and to be able to continue to provide the services in order to um, deal with the essentially the, the pandemic that T-boned the, the epidemic of addiction that's still ongoing. And so, that's been a really important aspect of this of this partnership and the and the support that we got from the Urban Health Institute as well. And, and and you know, there are other things we started to look at as well during this time. We, we took a an opportunity to start a screening process that we did remotely through uh, RedCap, and uh, we had individuals sit down at the computers that we purchased uh, through our IT department and had them sit down and say, "Hey, hey give us information about what's important." To you. You want mental health services. You want substance use disorder counseling. Uh, what's important in your recovery? And some of the information uh, we, we put together on this slide that related to the interface between spirituality and religion and their recovery. And we found that there were uh, transformations that are coming through during a person's time in the building. And uh, all to show that there's a, an opportunity to do more here. But people are coming in the door uh, having a a large uh, affinity toward religion and spirituality being important to re their recovery, but they're also uh, accepting things that they cannot change, part of the 12 steps uh, modality there. And that's very important to see that there's a growth across people strongly agreeing that they accept things they cannot change. And then there's also at the same time, an opportunity to explore religious beliefs and religiosity and faith and what that could be in terms of a role in this process. Not to say that everyone who came in the door uh, is in that vein. But um, the fact that there is a common threat here showed us that there's an opportunity to explore a lot more in terms of data as well. And the telehealth equipment allowed us to do that safely through the pandemic. And then uh, I modified a slide here, uh, Dan and I were working on, but I, I do think 
the biggest part of this is that we were able to really uh, build and maintain trust at a much higher level than we were before the pandemic. It forced us to sit together. And, and a lot of the things that I, I put on this slide and the next slide are, are tenets of the, uh, the Center for Health Equity faculty that we put together, the, the things that are necessary for building and maintaining trust, communication, commitment, authentic communication. And that, that was a big piece of what we do. Um, and sometimes we do it with and without food and um, respectful collaborations and relationships are really important um, because there are tense times and you have to be able to manage that. And, and there's all that to maintain uh, sustainability of all this. And the reason I put this little box at the end is because um, oftentimes people might put the, the kind of the financials or the, the volumes at the beginning, but um, without the tenants that are on this slide, you wouldn't have the outcomes that are there below. And, um, I did put a, a number down there, uh, which I, I sometimes shudder when I see, uh, which is the amount of visits that we were able to accomplish over the first year and a half of COVID. And that is the comparison uh, to all the other providers in the Johns Hopkins medicine system. Um, so I, I would say that's a testament to what we as a team, not just me, but as a team uh, can accomplish when these uh, modalities and when these uh, tenants are put into play. But uh, Dan, any more to add to this? No, I think that covers it. It shows the the value of the of the embedded partnership that we have here, and it it you know I think that authentic communication and respectful relationships is just keeping that communication wide open and having respect one for each other. So it's been a very powerful partnership. Absolutely, and I think this is our last slide. Um, I'll start with the beginning part, Dan, just by saying you know I've often said. You know, we shouldn't put the academic and the research at the beginning of this. So we have to make sure we keep in mind what are the needs of helping a mission. Um, otherwise, we we might miss each other's missions, and um, that's going to be hard to maintain things. But um, from your standpoint, uh, I'll let you kind of fill in the rest of these bullet points on this slide to, to wrap up. I think there's a freeze there, but uh, you know, I think it's really important at this point to say, you know, the organizational strengths are important. Helping a mission has strengths um, and, and Hopkins has strengths as well. Um, but I think really approaching them in a, a respectful way uh, and identifying and, and incorporating that into what is done as a mission between the two requires compromise and negotiation. Um, and if we don't do that, it, it's going to be hard to sustain this partnership. But I think we've and able to do that even better because of the, the grant that we received. And once again, um, very, very, uh, very thankful for what we were able to see, receive from the Urban Health Institute. Great, thank you so much for another uh, fantastic presentation. Those numbers are pretty staggering, um, Dennis, the number of visits um, made. And, um, and I think a lot of your focus on partnership really kind of tees up the focus that I was hoping we could have for this panel um, discussion. And I know our audience has questions and please do feel free to go ahead and drop those in the chat and we'll certainly be making time for our audience questions. But you know, the, the Urban Health Institute, as I said earlier, really, um, you know, our ultimate mission is to advance health equity in Baltimore. And I think it's really clear that both of you and your projects um, were doing that. Um, and we do that through fostering academic and community partnerships. And so what I'd really like to do is ask some questions about the partnerships. And so that I hope that, you know, I'm sure there are audience members who have their own academic community partnerships, but there may also be audience members who are interested in, you know, learning more about how to develop those partnerships. So um, maybe I'll start with um, Tara and Carrie. Um, I'm interested a little bit about how you first got to know one another, how you became acquainted, and, um, you know, how you came up with the idea for the grant and really developed that idea and fleshed it out in, um, in the lead up to the application process. Yeah, I think I'm trying to even remember the first time we met, Gary. Um, I had started my master's program in nutrition and I moved to Baltimore. Really was missing my my home community. And I think I just kind of started hanging around. I think I had met Carrie through maybe a former native student at Johns Hopkins, if I remember correctly. And I kind of just started showing up and I 
I don't think they've gotten rid of me yet. I'm <laughs> just kind of around these days. Um, do you, is that how you remember it, Carrie? Yeah, and I, I remember um, we had events and it was a, an Indigenous Peoples Day powwow um, and we had a film festival at that time. And of course, at the film festival, we always have food. Um, so I, I think also Tara and I bonded over our love for food and the, the importance of food sovereignty and food security in the community, but also our community's desire to because of their trauma to reconnect with traditional foods and what what reestablishing that relationship looked like. But I also say like as, as urban native people, we also just find each other. I mean, cause we got to. Yeah, and in regards to the topic, um, I think it was just spending a lot of time like anecdotally and like talking with Carrie, like I saw people using food behaviors that were indicative of food insecurity, like really eating three, four or five plates of food at a community event. And you know, it's not because they're that hungry, but maybe that's their, their source of food for the day or several days. Um, and I think like in, in a point of uh, vulnerability and embarrassment was when I really started at Hopkins, I was really interested in diet quality. And I think that was really something that like I started being interested in. But like once I started spending time with community, like diet quality doesn't mean anything if you don't have food to eat in the first place. And it's more important that people eat then don't eat. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd rather people eat not, you know, high quality food than not eat at all. Um, so I think for me, that was also like a bit of like a, you know, this needs to be about what the community needs and wants and not what as a researcher, I think is maybe more intellectually interesting or something. And I found that food security is a whole very interesting field to be in. So um, it's been a really exciting thing. Is there anything else I missed there, Carrie? No, we kind well, of got started with here, I think your contribution, um, because I think at one point in time, also, I mean, that's that's sort of the privilege of being engaged in academic conversations where you're talking about, oh, we're going to decolonize our food systems and, you know, other organizations have plans for doing that. But the reality is that, um, it, you know, we, we're working with urban Native people who are in amplified experiences of poverty. And so, you know, I, I think, and I always say that Tara has made me more aware of times that we may be unintentionally food shaming um, based on the things that we're trying to, you know, make available to people. Because, you know, when we have someone donate deer or bison, and I think that's wonderful, and our community members who don't eat that, even though that may be a traditional food for them, are like, yeah, can't we just have, you know, Chinese food? And, you know, I have to step back and realize that as Tara said, it's more important that people eat than that we police or dictate what they do eat. Okay. Thank you both for that. I um I love that I think you're really highlighting like that bi-directional learning that's happening in the partnership. And um, you know, I think one of the nice things about this panel is that your project was um, funded as the start of a partnership. You all like establish your partnership and began working together, you know, using the funding from the Urban Health Institute grant. But um, as Daniel and Dennis highlighted, they had been, you know, Hopkins and Helping Up Mission had been in partnership for quite some time and you all like uh, I think really clearly talked about how you established that partnership, but I'd love to hear more about how, you know, you talked already about some of the challenges to maintaining a partnership and in particular um, that partnership during COVID and a hybrid work format. Um, if you wanna to speak to that. Tara, if I can chime in here. So at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that we realized was that um, even in a community or in a community where there's already food insecurity, COVID-19 really deepened um, that experience and deepened vulnerability for people in our community so that in studies that we did on the Indian Health Service level about attitudes that people had around COVID, people were less concerned about contracting COVID-19 than they were about how am I going to get food? I'm going to buy food there. There was scarcity at that time and people were really freaked out about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, again, being a, a federal contractor, received a ton of money like everybody else did from the feds trying to address this crisis. And initially we were going to work on a project and we did 
start conversations with Tara about how do we provide food to people to meet their needs? How do we provide traditional foods? If we can't get traditionally traditional foods, can we get traditionally adjacent foods? And seeing all of the restrictions that the federal government has around providing food to people when food is necessary for life. So I walked away from that again, feeling like there are so many ways that our government criminalizes poverty. Um, and it, it just seemed no more clear to me than, you know, really having the temerity to dictate who is deserving of having food, the same as having the temerity to dictate who is deserving of health care uh, based on socioeconomic status and race. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Daniel and Dennis, anything else to add about um, your establishing and maintaining your relationship as an academic community partnership? Dan, Dan I'll let you, let you go first there. Um, the, the only thing I would say is, you know, I kind of harkened back to, you know, Dennis talked about the longstanding partnership. I've been at Helping a Mission a little over four and a half years. And I just appreciate from the beginning that Dennis reached out to me and said, hey, let me, let me help you understand some of the some of the challenges, some of the, I think he used the word videotape, and uh, um, we've used a lot of different metaphors to describe, you know, kind of getting to know and working through the partnership, but sometimes it was sort of peeling back the layers of an onion, and that relationship foundation actually was pivotal when COVID hit, and we were talking on teams to be able to say, okay, how do we problem solve? How do we work together? How do we recognize that this pandemic, in a way, is a threat to our sort of ability to provide um, substance use disorder treatment to our community. How are we gonna overcome that? And I really appreciate the way, you know, I, I think Dennis can tell the story of how he got the idea for submitting to the grant. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, yeah I, I think for us, for, yeah, for us it was, things were going pretty smoothly and then boom, you know, we have to all go home and figure out how to get back in the building. So. I, I remember just walking around, I actually live outside, just out back of the Bayview campus. And I was walking around the park and said, how can we get this together? Um, how can we do something? And the email came through and it was, it was an opportunity. And, um, you know, telehealth was the only way to make this happen, I could see. So I, over the course of a couple of days, I sent something to Dan. Dan said, let's give it a try. Let's see what can happen. And um, I said, all right, let's, let's give it a shot. And um, I think Dan was upstairs. I was in the basement of the building the day we set it all up. Um, with masks on and, and just running around. And uh, it, it really was the only way um, because we, we'd had this partnership and uh, yeah, it, 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 the, the possibility of having it fall apart was a big motivator for us to do it. And I think it, it taught us some things of, of what we didn't know, especially when you have to do it over telehealth. Um, you, you look at uh, things that might've gone through the radar, the paperwork, the different communication process, uh, processes that happen. We just had to be a little bit more on our P's and Q's about the stuff that we had. Um, and I think now we're at the point, at, at least I'm at the point where um, when I'm bringing more people into the mix, because Dan and I have uh, probably had more things added to our plates uh, since then. Uh, now it's a question of how do you teach those principles to the people who come in? Uh, because they might not all know how to develop this partnership. And that, that's the, the good problem to have, I think, uh, of how to disseminate this. Thanks. You know, I think that you all have, you know, really given some great background on kind of how the relationship was established. I wonder um, if you could speak a little bit to the issues of trust and respect in a relationship like this. You know, there is a relationship that you're trying to develop between an academic partner and a um, leader in a community-based organization, but then there's also trust um, between an academic partner and the you know, community that that organization serves. And, um, and so maybe you could speak to some ways that, you know, in your relationship building, um, you know, how did you establish that trust and how did you demonstrate respect um, in a way that you um, advance the trust building process? I think I would like Carrie to start for us at least. I think she had some, we had some interesting conversations about this. Sure. I mean, just just being very blunt in the native community, um, Hopkins has gobbled up a lot of the places where 
folks used to live. Um, you know, if you look at a recent digital app or an app on Indigenous Baltimore, it talks about, you know, the area uh, around there being called the reservation at one point in time. And um, the Center for Indigenous Health is located in the Native community um, across the street from Northeast Market or not far from Northeast Market where there's a, a Lumbee Bakery, but the center itself has its gaze towards Hopi communities, Navajo communities. Um, so let us just say that Hopkins was not looked upon very favorably. You know, in, in black and brown communities I've worked with, I've, I've heard it referred to as the plantation. Um, but also I, I think for the native community, not understanding, you know, why is there a center for indigenous health here and they're not engaging with our community at all? Or why is there a center for indigenous health, but they are not opening opportunities to us as state recognized tribal members. Um, and, and that left out a lot of people who are from the Lumbee tribe of Car uh, North Carolina who live right in that area. So I think by Tara and some of the uh, other young indigenous women who are now part of the Center for Indigenous Health, being visible in the community made a, a huge difference. Um, and, and actually being part of the fabric of the community and starting to attend events um, that, that where we were gathering, I think it did a lot to, um, to, to move towards rehabilitating the image um, I, I guess one would say that Hopkins has as really an extractive entity in the city of Baltimore rather than than a, one that is truly a partner. Yeah, just to briefly add to that, I think there's a lot of larger conversations nationally about the academic gaze and who gets to define what it means to be Indigenous. And I don't look like what anybody ever wants to put on a poster for an Indigenous scholar. And that's like a very real thing. Um, but that's something kind of the Center for Indigenous Health is working to be better about is what who gets to decide who's Indigenous and how does that impact funding and very real health opportunities for our community. And so I think that's one of the biggest things with my work is really trying to highlight the urban Native experience and uplift that this is the majority of us are urban and the majority of us don't look like what you're going to see on most of these research funding opportunities and things like that. Um, but I really appreciate Carrie's candor with that. And I added some links in the chat if they're of interest to anyone. Thanks for that. I, I would just echo that I think that candor is really important. It's important for us to hear, Carrie, not just the historic distrust, but the present day distrust um, with Hopkins and the Baltimore community. So thank you. Um, Dennis or Daniel, do you have anything to add about trust building in your partnership and with your um, participants? I, I would say that, you know, a similar thing within the faith-based community that Hopkins just doesn't have the best reputation and uh, I remember just coming into the, the, the situation and people were saying, you know, this is going to turn into Hopkins at helping out mission and you know, then it'll just be Hopkins. And there was a lot of uh, difficulty with that. And so I think it really came down to asking questions of what what are the needs? What, what are we doing here? Is it uh, serving the mission versus just serving Hopkins? That was a big part. And some of it really came down to routine meetings, you know, making sure there was a routine to what we were doing, whether it's every week we meet, every month we meet and have a, a, a conversation about the same things and always ask, is there anything we're missing to leave room for or what might not be expressed? It's almost yeah. like a trauma-informed approach to uh, engaging between two individuals and two organizations. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Dennis. And I think um, the challenge that I had um, coming into my role is I, I heard a lot about the view of Hopkins and Cornerstone at helping a mission as being, this is competing for what we're doing. We're trying to run this program. And I know in my role, I've been trying to sort of message that, no, we're working together. This is a strong, you know, partnership. This is a service and a, and a, and a provider and academic and, you know, healthcare expertise that we don't have on our team. So to to really, for us as a Helping Up Mission community to really embrace that, we had to sort of overcome some of our own, you know, I think um, sort of views about it, it being a competition for resources and really reposition it as, this is about growing the pie of resources for our community. It's not about 
scrapping over, you know, pieces of a shrinking pie. The other thing that I would just highlight that I think to the value of the academic community partnership that I personally appreciate in my role at Helping Out Mission in the partnership with Dennis and his team is their ability to sort of speak in and help us as a as a faith-based recovery organization that may not have all of our sort of clinical and accreditation medical things in line to be able to help us sort of um, in the quality improvement program development area and, and to really be candid and open about, hey, these are some things that you're doing in your program because you're just kind of doing the best you can, but here's, here's some of the best practices and some of the research, some of the evidence base that you take a look, need to take a look at. And the way that that's done in a respectful, open way, I think is a really, um, it's a, it's, it's a strong aspect of the partnership that we have and something that we really um, celebrate and embrace. Yeah, I think, thanks for that. Those are all, I think, really insightful and honest um, responses. I wonder, um, as I sort of like finish up, I wonder if you all might be able to um, think about benefits and challenges to the the academic community partnership in advancing health equity in Baltimore. And um, maybe if you could boil down to, you know, one major or couple of major challenges to the partnership and um, in contrast, you know, maybe highlighting one or two of the major benefits to the partnership that you see from your perspectives. And again, audience members, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll put a challenge out there, which I think some people have texted me on the side. Sometimes writing this up um, is different than just the you know, community-based participatory research aspect. And writing this up as a, as a whole picture is a challenge of how to frame it. And I've looked at Harvard Business Review as an option. I've looked at different journals as an option. And capturing the, the gestalt of how this works um, in a paper that would shine like another academic paper that's a challenge, but an opportunity at the same time, because um, I think for this to be replicated uh, in a meaningful way, we, we probably need to figure out how to do that. Daniel, do you want to follow Dennis about benefits or challenges in your project? I, I mean, I think I highlighted some of the some of the benefits. I think the the you know the challenge I think coming out of um, this pandemic has really been about helping people sort of overcome some of the resistance to coming into a, a residential treatment program. And certainly we've seen some of the, you know, the increases in the, the um, overdose rates and some of the mental health challenges that increase. So I think, you know, working together to try to overcome those barriers that I think exist um, in a more pronounced way um, to, to, a willingness and a readiness for those that we serve to, to engage in treatment, particularly a long-term residential program and having to be sort of more proactive about our outreach efforts in the community, I think is a challenge that, that we face. Thanks. And Tara or Carrie? Yeah, maybe I can start with my challenge and then great thing, and then maybe Carrie can share hers. Um, I think as a student, it's just challenging, like you're, you have a lot on your plate and it's hard to get everything done and do everything the way you want to do it. And I think also I recently received an NIH nurse hour F31 grant and I had a really tough time with some reviewer comments that were um, not great, but one of the main things they were upset with was that I was equally prioritizing community dissemination along with academic dissemination, like not even saying like it's more important saying it's equal because I knew my audience and they were quite upset with that. And that's really hard to hear when like, that's the whole reason we do research, right? Is to make an impact on communities and for local action. And it's frustrating when reviewers at the NIH think that's maybe a problem and I should be prioritizing writing papers that most of the time nobody even reads. <laughs> so I think that was like a really big challenge and kind of like a, a maybe like heart struggle for me was like, do I even want to be in academia? This is what I'm gonna be fighting the rest of my career. But then the good things are like, I, I don't like the idea of burnout. It doesn't make sense to me, but I think a lot about nourishment. I think that's just me as a nutrition nutritionist, but I'm on so many projects and some of them I think of as malnourishing. They're taking my energy. They're not helpful for me, but then I get to spend time in community. Like we had the spring equinox conversation a few weeks ago 
And that really like filled me right up. I was like, this is exactly why I do this. This is why I'm here. This is why I came to do research in the first place. And so I think those are like the really, that's, it's my why, I guess is what I'm saying. So I think it's, even though it's hard and it takes time, it's, that's why I'm here, I guess. So I think those are my, my challenge and my maybe strength and go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, and, and I'll just amplify what Tara said. I mean, as an anthropologist, I'm keenly aware of the colonial underpinnings of the discipline that I'm in. And I am fortunate that I was sort of brought up in an anthropological tradition, uh, an applied tradition, that we are responsible to the communities that we are in. I mean, at one point in time, the idea of indigenous people doing anthropology in indigenous communities, let alone their own communities, um, you know, seemed just sort of, you know, un, unthought of. And I think in, in more critical anthropology, you know, when on the one hand, we say that we want to disseminate information to people in our community, and I'm going to be guilty of this, we use such obfuscatory language that the people that we're writing about don't understand what we're talking about. So I'm part of a movement called Cool Anthropology, where we disseminate anthropological information in ways that the people that we're, that we're responsible to can engage with and inform us, because I'm not interested in doing research for its own sake. I have to produce something that is going to benefit my community, because that is, a, as I'm sure is true for Tara, we are taught that those are the obligations that we have as Native people. We are obligated to our relatives not, you know, not to ourselves and our, our, you know, own desires only. Yeah, thank you all for those, you know, really honest thoughts. I think one of our participants has said that just to sort of reinforce what you all have said, the incentives for success in academia are often in direct contradiction with this type of work. And I think many of us that do this work um, would you know, agree with that. And, um, and additionally, we in, in academics aren't trained on this idea of community dissemination necessarily. And it's not really often, you know, it's promoted as something we should be doing. Um, and so I think that that is a really important part of this work and applaud you all for, um, for that piece. I would also just, so there's one other question here. So again, interesting, just comments from folks in the chat. One question that says, um, I'm curious about scale, whether it is growing coalitions or partnerships within these existing initiatives, or is it other GHU academics learning good practices from approaches like these? And I might take the first um, pass at trying to answer that. I would say from UHI's perspective, Lee, if you're asking about our Baltimore Health Equity Impact Grant, it's really both and. We really want to invest money in the partnership um, and the coalition building, and we really hope that these grants um, will be the start of a partnership if, or continuation of a successful partnership, but that, the, that it's not the only um, part of the partnership or the only moment in time that these two organizations are in partnership. We hope that this is sort of a sustained um, ongoing um, effort to promote equity in Baltimore. And we are very interested in, in providing training opportunities. And this event is that opportunity to amplify best practices for community academic partnerships. How do you do this work, which is really hard and we're really time consuming, which our panelists have talked about, but is also extraordinarily uh, rewarding and, and beneficial. So I think my response would be that really it, from UHI's perspective, it is both and. Um, do others have comments to that uh, question? Oh, and great. Thank you all for dropping your organizational um, websites here. Uh, I think you hit it on the head that, uh, you know, not one person or one partnership can do it alone. So um, we got to build what we have, but also, you know, spread it around. So you said it's right on to me. So with that, um, maybe just a quick one minute from each team. What are, what are, what is the next big exciting thing in your partnership? Um, well, I did get my NIH fellowship, which supports my doctoral dissertation research, which is looking at what are our cultural food values as American Indian or urban American Indian and Alaska Native people 
and how do those support our health and well-being? So really looking at what are our values and trying to untangle those from colonial food values and really big on like food compassion and empathy. I think Carrie mentioned that I'm really big on like no diet talk, no body shaming, no commenting on people's bodies. Like so really kind of trying to untangle what are our values as indigenous peoples from colonial food values and then creating a measure to reflect that. Um, so that's kind of my next step. But Carrie, they're doing all sorts of amazing stuff with just everywhere. I can barely keep up with. I feel like every time we chat, there's something new. Is there anything you want to highlight, Carrie? Yes. So um, not directly part of Tara's work, but in the spirit of it, um, we are looking forward to hosting our uh, or partnering in the hosting of a the first two spirit or a, that's a indigenous term for our uh, queer community a, a gathering. Uh, in in July and uh, of course food and food ways are going to be an important part of that so lots of discussion around that. Thanks and congratulations Tara and to you Carrie for that new grant that's really exciting and we hope you'll come back and share your learning and expertise with us in the future. Dennis and Daniel? Yeah I think for the the Hopkins uh, Helping a Mission Partnership uh, that we have on site looking at medical Applications for addiction treatment and addiction recovery are going to be very important. We've already started a partnership with the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy on the Bayview campus, where we have women who are living and helping up mission, receiving methadone, buprenorphine as they live in the spiritual recovery program and still getting their comprehensive care at Bayview. And we're looking to sustainably and safely expand that to make sure that it can reach more individuals while they're in the helping up mission. I know for, for years, for decades, that had been uh, there have been barriers to that happening while helping a mission, but um, that's going to be a big move. And as Dan mentioned, Hopkins is looking forward to being that partner and being that advisory time. Dan, more to add there? The only thing I would just add is that, you know, that's another outcome of the partnership, really, that we've had with Hopkins is to, to sort of move move that, um, you know, to move helping a mission to, to a place of changing our our philosophy on, on addiction recovery so that we could really embrace that, that really, uh, you know, best practice uh, standard of care that we, you know, in the, in the past have not been as willing to engage in. So I think that's a major step forward and really a, 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 an outcome of this, of this partnership and our work together. And to the extent that, you know, Dennis was in front of our board, you know, kind of making the case for, change in some of our philosophy statement on that front. So it's been a really powerful aspect of our growth and development. That's great. Well, really exciting things to come for, for all of you and your organizations. And just a huge thank you to you for taking the time to share your work with us for all of the amazing work you all do in the Baltimore community. Um, and we look forward to continuing our relationship and dialogue and, um, and collaboration. So. With that, I will pass it to Deirdre to um, wrap us up. Yeah, and let me echo um, my thanks as well. Um, really, really wonderful panel and, and about just tremendous work and, and would love to, um, I need to come up with a better Twitter name after seeing uh, Carrie's, but um, would love to in particular talk about your work because it, it does intersect with the type of work that I do too. So it's, it's uh Really, really exciting uh, work to hear and great to hear from Dennis and Daniel, whose work I knew a little bit about, um, but great to hear it in more detail. So I'm um, really great. So I'm excited to share um, as we're closing out here that our next jam session on May the 10th will actually be a hybrid session. So we're now emerging in a time in the pandemic where we're actually ready to have both an in-person and a virtual component. Um, and so for those of you that are able to come to the East Baltimore campus, we'll be in the, the Poe Room in the 2024 East Monument Street Building, um, as well as for those of you that need to um, tune in virtually, we'll still have the Zoom option, but we definitely hope you'll be there in person. We'll have some, have some snacks um, <laughs> to entice you. Um, and we're really thrilled to have two international guests, actually, um, who will be joining us in person. Uh, Dr. Leona Carroll, who is a general practitioner who specializes in mental health and uh, the health of older adults, um, who's coming from Scotland's National Health Service, and Dr. Miriam Zaguli, who is uh, the clinical lead in the Department of Obstetrics at Oslo University Hospital and an associate professor um, um, at the University of Oslo in Norway. And what they'll be doing is providing some overviews um, from their 
uh, respective healthcare systems and talking about some of the unique challenges of addressing health inequality within the context of universal healthcare settings. I think many of us here in the US think, well, if only we had um, universal healthcare, we could get rid of most of the challenges that we have here. And, and certainly uh, colleagues around the world tell us that they have their own set of challenges as well. So we'll get to hear about some of that. Um, so please uh, plan to tune in um, either in person, I hope, or, or, or virtually on, on May the 10th, still at the same time at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So thank you all and enjoy this beautiful spring weather. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.